multi-dimensional data and why this is an important problem. Uh, very briefly introduce deep learning and then just give you a few examples of matrix and tensor, and tensor factorizations in deep learning frameworks for these problems, okay? Uh, so here are some reference books. I mean, I don't know, did you guys have a first course in machine learning? Did any of you have other course, yeah? Uh, in any case, some of these things will be general. So some of the things you might already know. Uh, if you're more interested, this is a bunch of reference books. Uh, essentially, this one is pretty recent. This one covers deep learning a lot. Uh, and there is this book called Dive into Deep Learning, which I really recommend if you are if you want to see basically theory and code, right? So this book is written in Jupyter Notebooks. So you, while you read the theory, you can also execute the code in let's say a couple of languages. Uh, so if you're a new PhD student, I would recommend reading things about the PhD experience, uh, whether they will be directly applicable to you or not, I don't know. But I think it's very useful to understand the kind of, let's say, shared experiences that you will be going through. Uh, to this end, there is this really nice book called How to Get Your PhD. But you know, it's a book that uh, you have to buy it, but it has three chapters that are free. Uh, and I really think that these three chapters are enough, right? The basically chapter three says things that will happen. And I think it's really it's really important to to go through it. And these are a few images from that book. So the the first image says basically you will think that you're an imposter and that everyone knows everything and you know just a small subset. But in reality, you should always remember that you know not everyone else knows exactly what you know. Uh, it's going to be a roller coaster, so it's going to have ups and ups and downs. So you have to kind of work with that and expect it, and you know find the joy in the work rather than the outcome. And there is also in this book there's a very nice PhD bingo. So you print this page out and you take each of these boxes when you when you feel like it. Okay, so I I recommend looking into this. Uh, now beyond that, if you've never written a, a let's say technical paper, there is this very nice presentation by Dimitri Bertsegas which is called 10 Simple Rules for Mathematical Writing, which I think is a, is a very nice read because it kind of shows how to, let's say, linearize you know, your thought process when you're trying to describe a complicated concept. And at the end, you know, put all these paths together and explain to people. I mean, I think one of the, one of the interesting things that Dimitri says here is that mathematical writing requires slow reading, right? So you should make the job of the reader much easier. Uh, there are also some other books. This is what this book is on punctuation, commas, and this kind of stuff. And my supervisor gave it to me in my undergraduate. So I needed to learn a lot about this. And also the elements of style. But I think for papers, these 10 simple rules are quite, quite interesting. Okay, so I mean, you have to be living on Mars already uh, if you haven't seen the latest developments in machine learning and AI. And I mean, when I say latest developments, it's difficult to define. Because you know, in 2015 we had some developments, then we had some more developments. Then we have you know products like uh, Amazon's Alexa, uh, Google Echo, and so on. Uh, and then you have computer vision in your phones, and now you have computer vision in your drones. So you know, at the end of the day, these developments are, let's say, uh, multiple. They're multimodal. Let's say they happen, and then another development happens. The most recent one is large generative models. So basically, the idea of using billions and billions of data, um, which have been annotated, but by chance, right? They have been annotated because Google archives images are having, let's say, a caption for people that you know they cannot see. So essentially, uh, we use this as annotation and we build foundation models for uh, visual, let's say, or auditory data, which are trained on uh, billions and billions, let's say, of data that can then do a lot of tasks that seem to be an extrapolation of what they have learned, although it, practically it might not be. Um, so we've reached the point where, you know, with uh, stable diffusion or DALI, you can generate artworks that win competitions. Of course, this is not so straightforward, right? It's not a one go thing. It's a back and forth interaction. And we are now trying to see what to do with schools and coursework because everyone can get the solutions of ChatGPT, which might not be a bad thing in the end. So I I would be you know amiss not to mention this paper by Alan Turing written like in the fifties, that's like seventy years ago, uh, where Turing predicted that by the end of the century people will be able to talk about machines thinking, right? Uh, 
And Jeffrey Hinton in 2023 said he's confident that they do think. And I think that that process is kind of simulated. Uh, now, of course, I mean, I'm not going to stand here a lot, but when we talk about artificial intelligence, intelligence and all these things, usually these are really ill-defined, right? Uh, these are not concepts that are defined very rigorously, but we can use working definitions. Like, for example, if you put a slime mold in a maze, then the slime molds join together and they find shortest paths between their locations and food, right? So in principle, if we can say that this is, let's say, an intelligent behavior, the interesting thing is that there is no nervous system, right? So it's just intelligent behavior that emerges. And for intelligence, we can use a working definition that it's like, you know, uh, if I have a problem and I find a solution that uses minimal energy or least energy, then my solution is probably intelligent. But in any case, this is a parenthesis. Um, just a second. Is this stuck again? Okay. So why do we need machine learning? I mean, there is a complicated question and they're not complicated, but uh, can be answered in many ways, let's say. Uh, but one of the main reasons is that we have knowledge in the world that we cannot encode via function. So we don't know what the analytical function is that describes a phenomenon, let's say, right? And we cannot capture that. Um, or if we even if we do, we might need to do it faster. Um, and to a large extent, this has to do with learning from real world data, which have a lot of natural deformations, right? So to give you an example, I mean, this is a, a slide I always use, which which I stole from Rando de Freitas, actually. I don't know if he stole it from someone else, but essentially, if you want to, let's say, recognize objects in computer vision, then how much deformation should these objects go through and still be the object that you that you want, still belong in the object class, right? So how much can I deform a giraffe uh, and still classify it as a giraffe? So it's a question that we can address either by designing algorithms that have inductive biases that give rise to this phenomena, right? So if I design a network that can allow specific forms of deformations, then uh, by its nature, when I'm training it on such data, it will capture the, let's say, right class of invariances. Uh, another reason to do it is from data. So basically I can generate data that have the, all the possible deformations that I encounter in nature. Uh, and by fitting the model on that data, I can basically, let's say, induce the classes of invariance that I want to capture. And of course, as I mentioned before, language offers supervision for free. It's not for free, but it's already available and can be used. So the idea with machine learning is that it kind of spins the traditional programming paradigm on its head. So when we're usually talking about programming, we have data, we have some sort of data, let's say we have CT scans or whatever, and we're writing a program that processes this data in order to achieve an output, which is, let's say I'm detecting a tumor, right? When you go into the context of machine learning, this is spinned around. In which way? Well, in the supervised, let's say, machine learning paradigm, you have some data, which could be CT scans, and you have some desired outputs, which are, let's say, the annotations of a radiologist. So in essence, what the machine learning algorithm will do is it's a box that will give you a program, which is the model fitted with its parameters, which we can later use just with data in order to arrive at the new output. Right, So it fits very well with a traditional paradigm and it kind of spins it to allow you to derive programs right, instead of just getting your output and use those programs in a general way afterwards. So in essence, if we go back to the 60s, Arthur Samuel defined this as giving computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Now, of course, we have a lot of data, right? And this is one of the main reasons that things have changed. I mean, there is developments in algorithms, there is new architectures, but you know, the previous time that we had nice architectures, we didn't have the data, so nothing happened. Uh, but due to the, let's say, social media and the digital revolution and you know, internet, we have, you know, we've reached the point where we now will be producing something like uh, a lot of exabytes of data, right? So we're talking about more data that we can use. Although there's a big discussion in terms of, you know, how, uh, how much curation you need to do to this data in order to utilize them. But in any case, this has brought us this far. So 
based on the development of the ImageNet database, which was the first database that had like millions and millions of subjects and categories. It's a database that's inspired by WordNet, which is another database that, that models language. We have been able to train very large scale models that are parallelizable and scalable, right? So you can distribute them over many GPUs. And at the end of the day, you can get, I mean, first of all, this red line is human performance. So with these developments, we achieved better performance, let's say, than human performance, although you know, this is arguable on the data set, I should say. Uh, and this has been decreasing ever since to the point where you know, it's almost meaningless to try to improve the results here, right? They're, they're really good. So in essence, there was a paradigm shift observed where we went from small data sets and rigorous methodology that generalized very well, maybe closer to statistics, let's say, uh, to, to methods that are very, very, very greedy and large scale. We're talking about billions and trillions of parameters in terms of degrees of freedom. Uh, and now we reach at this point where we can wake up one morning and ask, you know, stable diffusion to give us a picture of a hipster llama wearing a hat, et cetera, et cetera. And it works, right? So, so what has happened is, let's say, both algorithms uh, and data availability and people realizing that you know GPUs are good for games, but they're also good for machine learning because both of them rely on linear algebra, right? And those operations are really fast. Um, this is, I'm just showing you this. I just asked Bart to solve the exercise that I gave in the machine learning course. It solved it really well, right? So this basically creates questions in the sense of what kind of coursework should people give to students, right? I don't know. Some people say, that exams now should be AI open and, you know, open book and open AI, right? Which, I don't know, maybe we can ask ChatGPT what kind of exercises it cannot solve and then give these ones as, as questions. Uh, okay, so before I finish this kind of introduction of the introduction, I'm just sharing this paper by Claude Shannon. It's called The Bandwagon, and it's a paper that he published back in the 50s which says basically that he developed information theory and basically he said, you know, people were be becoming very interested in it as a means of, you know, studying the communication channels, et cetera. And basically Shannon wrote this paper and said, guys, I mean, it's nice, but it's not going to solve everything, right? And everyone wants to ride the bandwagon, but it doesn't mean it's going to solve all the problems of humanity. And I, I'm just saying because this, I think, is the kind of something that lasts through time and maybe people can say this about deep learning and AI at the same time. Uh, and I'm gonna wrap this up since you're some of your new PhD students with this paper by Abraham Flexner, uh, who was in the advanced advanced the Institute for Advanced Studies in the US again back in the okay, that was uh, in the 40s, even before that. And he has this nice paper where he discusses the usefulness of useless knowledge, which I recommend that you read, but I'm not gonna talk a lot about it. Okay, so let's let's give some introduction to machine learning in case. Uh, some of you haven't heard about it before, and deep learning. So traditionally in machine learning, we have two main types of learning. I mean, we also have reinforcement learning, but I'm not talking about it here a lot, not because it's less important, but because I'm not talking about it here a lot. Uh, so supervised learning, usually people give us some data, they give us some labels, like an object detection, object classification problem. Uh, and they say, well, okay, given my data, which has some particular properties that may or may not be known to some extent, find the right function. So it's we can think of this as a function approximation problem, right? Find the right function that when I give you this data as input, the right transformations are being made. And at the end of the day, I get the correct classification. And in unsupervised learning, we just have some data. And essentially our goal is to learn some underlying structure from our data, right? Uh, examples of this include clustering, you know, density estimation, dimensionality reduction, and so on and so forth. So in the, in the supervised learning setup, we essentially are given a data set. Uh, the data set contains inputs, input vectors usually, but they could be structured, they could be tensors, they could be you know, other types of, uh, of uh, matrices. Uh, we have a label and we have a label space, which can be real numbers. So when we're predicting real numbers as regression, or our label space could be discrete, so when we're doing predictions of discrete labels, it would be a classification, let's say. So this, we know that these samples X, Y are drawn from an unknown distribution. And our goal is to learn a hypothesis function, H, 
which will allow a new pair of data that we, let's say, gather from the real world to be classified correctly. So we want the output of the hypothesis function that we choose to approximate the label space. So the interesting thing here is that, okay, let's say we know this distribution. Can we get 100% accuracy? Um, that's a quick thing about it, and we'll, we'll get back to this. So after selecting a hypothesis class, when I say hypothesis class, I mean, here's a neural network with this type of architecture, right? That's a class of uh, hypothesis functions where by changing the hyperparameters, I can change, let's say, the instance of the function, of the hypothesis. So after I select it, my goal is to find the right hypothesis function within my family that minimizes some type of error on my data. So this L function here is my loss. Uh, after we do this, we want to evaluate our function on unseen test data. That's because maybe let's say by accident in our training data, we'll have very specific examples that are easy to fit. And also we don't want to fit our training set 100%. And I will tell you why in a bit. So ideally, if we have many samples drawn uh, IID from the same distribution P, which in reality doesn't uh, usually hold, but in any case, uh, we can change our model to adapt to that. We basically can estimate an unbiased, basically have an unbiased estimator of the true generalization loss. So I have, if I have infinite data in my testing set, this means that my error, the error on my testing set should approximate the true generalization error. And when I say true generalization error, I mean, if you give this model to someone as a product or service, you can tell them the generalization error of the model is this much, let's say. And this is due to the law, uh, the weak law of large numbers, right? So the empirical average of data drawn from this distribution converges to this expected value. Now, why don't we, we want to fit the data set 100%? Because there are errors both in our outputs and our inputs, right? When we simulate data, we have approximation errors. When we gather data from the real world, we have measurement errors. So in principle, in this plot that I'm showing here, the green plot, the green points are the measurements that we get from the sensor, let's say, uh, and the blue line is the fit that we get, and the red uh, curve is a true function, right? So basically, the blue fit is quite good, but we see that it doesn't exactly capture um, the true function, which is the red one. We know it's the red one here because it's a simulated example, right? Usually, we don't know what the true function is. But in essence, what we see here is that we could change our function a little bit, but we will never change this kind of function to, to map to this point, which is clearly an outlier. So essentially, this is f of x here, and epsilon one is the noise that we have in our measurement, which usually we cannot predict, but we would assume that it has a particular type, let's say, it's from a particular distribution, and it has a particular variability. So if here we fit all these green points, then we'll get like a crazy curve that doesn't generalize to anything, right? So basically this is formalized by the concept of a Bayes optimal classifier. Again, I'm not gonna go into details here, but essentially let's say that we have a classifier. We know the distribution of our training data, of our test data, let's say, or whatever data we have. We know P of X comma Y. And we say, okay, I'm gonna make a decision my X is this much, how much is my Y, right? If I base that decision on the true distribution, I will still have an error. And that's the error that has to do with label bias. So if in my data, I have points that are really close by and they have different labels, who would know which the correct one is, right? I mean, the optimal regressor would take the expected value of all these labels, but that would be you know, probably not sensible. So in a sense, even if we know the distribution of the of the of our data, because they, they there could be a label bias, uh, we would still have, let's say, an error an error rate which is non-negligible. So there is basically what I'm trying to say is that you can choose the right architecture, you can choose the right data, and you can still have an error, and that's okay because probably you need some sort of other information to reduce the uncertainty of your problem, right? With the data that you have. This is what you can do. But of course, now more recently, uh, we have, let's say, other types of learning besides uh, supervised and uh, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. Uh, 
super uh, basically this is a quote from Hinton that kind of alludes to this bus in back in 96 so the idea is you know if you just get supervision from your parents when you're growing up I mean they tell you that's a dog and then they tell you that's a dog but then you see dogs and you understand they're dogs you generalize right so in principle what Geoffrey Hinton is alluding to here is that we need to extract information from the input we sense the world right we as humans sense the world in very high definition uh, and we keep learning representations from that from that world, right? Which generalize. How can we do that in a machine learning context? Well, there's a, a very easy way. We're basically encouraging the network to learn the distribution of our input by perturbing it, right? So I take, I have a bunch of images. Uh, I start removing and masking parts out or language. And I try to predict those masked parts or I corrupt them. And I try to predict the, the, let's say, corrected version, the denoised version. All of these uh, ideas are very central to how we train modern uh, machine learning models. So you have 1 million data, and you take each data point, you corrupt it, and then you predict what the right version is, which allows you, which basically forces the model to develop a very, let's say, good understanding of the underlying data distribution, because it can, you know, it can, it can operate on it, let's say. Okay, so summarizing this introduction, we have uh, discriminative models that do, let's say, they're usually supervised. They do regression, they do classification. We have generative models that learn joint probabilities. They need more data to generalize because they learn a joint distribution, right? So they, that is much more complicated than learning a conditional distribution, right? So instead of saying, you know, if my input is this, what's my output here? We're saying, what does my input look like and what are the characteristics and correlations that it has across all the input, right? While when you're answering the question, given this, what's the output, maybe you select you know, one value from the vector and that's it. Uh, and I've alluded to this before, foundation models are this new type, let's say, not new type, but new approach, new paradigm of training large scale generative models on you know, very, very, very large data and then giving you the model and then you can use it for a lot of tasks. I mean, ChatGPT is one example, right? Um, of course, you know, up to this date, there are a lot of challenges. I'm not going to enumerate them, but, you know, having reliable AI models or machine learning models for visual or other tasks is a very challenging, let's say, endeavor. The alignment problem is very difficult. Uh, interpreting this, this uh, network is becoming more and more difficult because they have you know, so many parameters that it's like doing what some people call artificial neuroscience, right? You need someone to study billions of neurons and how they, uh, they fire. Uh, and, you know, learning invariances, geometries, bias, efficiency. Efficiency is quite important because, I mean, uh, OpenAI is now charging two or three million to find you charge GPT on your problem, right? So this kind of shows the cost that these companies have in you know, running this software. So it's it's still much more expensive than we would like it to be. Okay, so uh, basically one of the primary problems that deep learning is addressing to some extent is how one can learn from high dimensional data. So in principle, I mean, I have a few signals here, but most interesting signals in the real world are high dimensional in one way or another, right? So if I have, let's say, a thousand by a thousand image, that's like, I don't know, uh, the cameras like in the 90s, right? That was one million pixels. So that's one million random variables that you have to study. You can have high sample rate audio files. You have geospatial data or hyperspectral data with many slices of, let's say, specific bandwidth of information. Uh, you have videos. So it's, you know, most of the signals that we sense and we simulate are high dimensional in some way or another. Otherwise they would be studied very easily with more rudimentary methods. And the other problem is that we have very high intra-class variability. So essentially a class of an object has all these deformations that we talked about before. And we need to find some way of expressing this as a locality because machine learning works and learning works when we operate on a space where we have some sort of locality. So being neighbors means something. Uh, if you cannot measure which are your neighbors, then there's no point in learning. Like you haven't learned anything, right? 
So the, the, the idea is basically instead of uh, uh, instead of working on a high dimensional space where we don't have locality, we project onto a space that we do. So let's say that we have this problem. I have to learn how to function this thing. Um, we have this problem, someone gives us a data set. These are three faces of people, three more faces. And we're asking the question, who is this person, right? Clearly this person is Darwin, right? But if you just subtract the pixel values of the images and get like a, a norm to measure the distance, what you will see is that this image is closer to this one than this one to this one, right? So this basically means that if we operate on the image space, which is high dimensional, we cannot get any answer that makes sense, right? Because it's the, let's say the sepia tone here of the image, uh, the pose, you know, how can you subtract these things without aligning? It doesn't, doesn't make sense. And this is basically the so-called curse of dimensionality, which basically says that, okay, I have a line, I want to sample three points, here they are, right? With epsilon 0 0.1, let's say, on this line. So the distance between each point is 0 0.1. If I want to sample from a two-dimensional space, I need these points to the power of two, right? In order to cover the space. So I have, you see here, I have nine samples. So it's three to the power of two, let's say. And this goes on as much as we increase dimensionality. So if I have images that are 1 million pixels, I should need, let's say X is the amount of data I want to sample from each dimension. So X to the power of 1 million is the data that I should need to cover this distribution. So in practice, that's probably more than the atoms that we have in the universe, right? It's not, we're not gonna have more data than the atoms in the universe. It's kind of like, it's not gonna happen. So essentially the curse of dimensionality tells us that we need an exponential amount of data with respect to dimensionality. And also that in high dimensions, there are no close neighbors. The distance between the samples is always large. So what does this mean? I mean, there is an example to look at this by doing Monte Carlo simulations of a sphere embedded in a unit cube. And as you increase dimensionality, let's say over 17, you will see that all the points are spread to the to the angles of the of the cube, right? And the sphere doesn't have anything inside. So if you're doing a K and N query, you're finding the nearest neighbors, and this is the center, and you're looking at this sphere, you're not going to find any neighbors, right? And essentially, okay, if you want to verify this more, you can do experiments measuring the distance between randomly generated points of different dimensionalities. And you will see that as I increase dimensionality, the distances become a delta. So every point is far apart from every other point. So the conclusion is we cannot operate directly on the image space and expect to get something sensible. Now, this is in theory. In practice, sometimes some strange tricks work. Uh, and that's because the distributions that we work with are favorable, right? You want to classify faces, faces are symmetric. So basically you have redundancy, half of the information is unnecessary most of the time. Uh, so you can find spaces where this behaves uh, nicely. But in general, we want to learn representations. Uh, and in essence, this is why uh, deep learning has been so successful. Deep learning is a way of learning representations. It's a way of getting high dimensional data that you collect from the real world or you simulate. And then by defining an architecture uh, which has specific inductive properties and then a loss function and the specific modules of the network, you can arrive at the end, let's say, when you get to the final depth um, of the network, Hey, this is behaving on its own. It's changing the function of the button. Nice, has AI probably. So, if you reach the if you reach the end of the network, you should have features that behave very well when you plug them into your problem. Okay, and that is basically what deep learning is, right? We're extracting, 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 and then we put like a traditional classifier from the nineties on top, right? Um, so the the whole idea behind learning representations, as I discussed before. It will have the high dimensional original space. We learn a function to go to a, let's say, uh, I would say compressed space. It's not always compressed, but it's a latent space that captures the essence of our data. This usually can be, for example, a subspace or a submanifold, right? So basically this means, you know, if I want to encode all human faces, I probably need 20 values or 25 values. 
because what am I going to describe? I'm going to describe hair color, you know, eye color, you know, uh, I don't know, origin or skin tone or, you know, uh, lips, how the lips are, the mouths, you know, all these things. I just need like 20, 25 variables and that's fine. So if you give me, you know, 10 million pixel images, I should ideally find a very small vector that can reconstruct that original image. Now, when I say reconstruct, this is the typical function that's used in reconstruction settings. So basically you say, okay, here's my data. Uh, I'm compressing my data to a low dimensional space with G of X. And with the inverse function, I'm pulling the data back to the original space. And you're saying, okay, if I can reconstruct my data with good enough accuracy, then it means that my compressed space does what I want to do, right? If I can, if I have an image that's, let's say one million pixels and I get 10 values here, which when I plug these 10 values back into the network, I get the original image back exactly the same with a small epsilon. It means it worked, right? And usually uh, we impose these conditions on Z to be low dimensional in order to avoid a trivial solution. But there are other ways of doing that, okay? So when I say trivial solution, Z could be the identity function. It could just copy X. Right? So one of the most prominent methods, uh, can I remove this thing? Um, probably not. Oh, well. So one of the, one of the most commonly used methods like since 1910 is principal component analysis. So PCA is a very simple approach. It says, you know, how can I preserve the variance in my data, right? Uh, basically, how do we preserve variance in the original data? We try to maximize variance because the maximum variance we can keep is the data, that's, it's the variance that's in our original data. So what PCA does is basically it solves a very simple linear problem, which allows us to go from X to Z, to W transpose, and then from Z to X through W. Uh, okay, so guys, we're we're a bit late because we started a bit late. So let's see how it goes. I can skip some things. Uh, okay, so just to give you an intuitive example, this is a point cloud, right? And when we ask the question, what's the direction of maximum variance? We can see which points have the most distance from each other. And this will give us, let's say this red line here, which is the first principal component. The second one is orthogonal to the first. Uh, and in this way, we find directions, which when we project the data upon these directions, then we end up with a, let's say, one dimensional representation that could capture, let's say, 99% of the variance of the data, which means we throw away a lot of data. Now there's the analogous paradigm uh, for multiple sequences, that's CCA, that's canonical correlation analysis. And the basic idea here is to learn individual linear mapping. So you go from X1, uh, to a, to, a, to a reduced dimensionality space from X2 to a reduced dimensionality space. And you ensure that these projections are uh, close enough, which basically by extension is what we see now with clip. If you work with clip representations before uh, and so on. Okay, so there's a very nice path from the 1910 to, 19, to, I don't know, 2015, right? So we start with linear things. We do PCA, we do probabilistic variants of that. And at the end of the day, if the function that maps to your bottleneck space is a network, and the function that maps from your bottleneck space to the real space again is again a network, then we have an autoencoder. So we have a deep learning architecture, right? So the paradigm of you know learning representations has wide applicability uh, in in all kind of manifestations, let's say. Uh, and of course, now that we have deep learning, we can use the previous approaches, like the linear approaches like PCA and so forth, in order to explain and uh, interpret and also make more efficient uh, the networks that we have today. Because we can operate on the weight space, let's say, of the network or the activation space, which is now, let's say, it it's rich in semantics, right? In a way that the original data is not. Okay, so this is, again, a visualization of the, of the, of the autoencoder what I've talked to you before about compression. And finally, let me talk a little bit about tensor methods. So all the methods that I've shown before in the linear space, like PCA or CCA, uh, they operate using these linear projections, but the data that we encounter in nature are actually three-dimensional or four-dimensional. And even if you look at the neural network, the layers and the structure in the layers is three-dimensional or four-dimensional and so on. 
So in principle, tensor methods, uh, they're based on, uh, basically are a, a multilinear, a high dimensional, high order extension of matrices. So you can have 3D, 4D or 5D tensors or 60, you know, up to the level that you want. And the idea is that there are specialized decompositions that you can use without changing the structure of the, of the tensor. So if you are going to do PCA or SVD or something, or even a flattening operation in a neural network, at the end of the day, you get back a vector. So that vector doesn't have any structural information uh, that may be contained, let's say, in the layers, that may be contained in your original data. And locality is a different concept now. While if you use tensor methods directly, then you preserve this sort of uh, structure that exists in the data, and you can do very smart things with it. So this is the CP decomposition that takes a tensor and decomposes it into a sum of rank one components. So that's basically three vectors, but when you do an outer product, the two vectors give you a matrix and you do another outer product, the two vectors give you a tensor, right? Because outer products give you matrices, you put another angle, it becomes a, a tensor. And similarly with Tiger decomposition. So this gives you these favorable properties that I discussed, and then I'll show you some examples later. Now, uh, because we're running out of time and we started late, I will be a bit quick here. Um, so I had some slides to discuss a little bit how, uh, deep learning and how it works for natural signals, but I'm going to explain it really quickly. Basically, uh, it happens that the inductive uh, bias, let's say, or the properties of convolutions are very appropriate for natural data. Why is that? Let's say uh, three properties, three main properties. These are not exhaustive. Uh, usually in natural signals, there is some sort of stationarity, right? We have repeating patterns and we have similar information and in images when the pixels are nearby. Uh, we have locality. The neighbors are more correlated than other points, right? We would expect locality. Otherwise, machine learning wouldn't work. And signals are usually compositional, right? We have words, we make sentences, you know, we have... Uh, from sentences we make documents and so on. Now, convolutional neural networks are pretty good in this because they don't have connections from everything to everything. So there is some sort of imbued, let's say, sparsity. Uh, the hidden neurons don't need to span our whole input, but there's something called the receptive field, which basically means that, you know, if I connect this node to these nodes, then my final node will also read my original input, right? By reading the values of these of these nodes here, right? So this is called the receptive field. Uh, there is also parameter sharing. So we have a convolutional kernel in uh, CNN, let's say, and we shift it around the image. So in principle, this means if, you know, one feature activates where I'm there in the room and then I change my position, when the kernel comes to me, it's gonna activate again. So I'm learning something that's translation environment in a way. Uh, and this kind of leads to the, to the nice, this nice visualization I stole from somewhere, of actually from, I think from the Stanford Deep Learning course, which shows how, you know, given let's say an input tensor, we have a couple of filters, we pass them through the image and we do get, you know, our output volume. And this is the property of translation equivariance or invariance. So when we say translation invariance, we basically mean that, you know, my model is translation invariant. If I change, if I translate my input data, I still get the same output. When we say translation equivariance, we basically mean that the bottleneck uh, layers of the network will show a corresponding shift in the features they, they, they generate according to our input. And this is what we can see here, right? So we're changing the position of our input. We're translating it and we see that the output of the network before the classification shifts analogously, right? So this is translation equivariant. Okay. Okay, so we discussed about these properties and very very much in passing, uh, just to mention that the other, let's say, leading architecture are transformer networks. Uh, they can be used in tandem with CNNs because transformer ne networks get a set of patches, let's say the encoder gets a set of patch encodings uh, as their input. And this can be, you know, we can take the image split in 16 parts and just push it through as words would be in a sentence, right? Uh, because this is the architecture that's used in LLMs, right? Uh, or we can use a CNN to generate these tokens. And the, the main idea with transformer networks is that they look at relationships between all these input patches, right? 
they're auto regressive models in general. They can be seen as auto regressive models. Uh, so the reason we don't do this on pixels is because that would be computationally intractable. Okay, that's why we have patches. Uh, now the, the vision transformers, they have some nice properties. They can give us right away some sort of explanation on the output. So we can see that the parts of the images that have been used for classification are highlighted here for the attention maps. And this similarly holds when you look at attention maps, let's say for translation. So I have a sentence in French here and a sentence in English here. And the attention layer tells us, let's say, which word matches with which word from the other language. And this is important because the order of words in different languages is not the same when you say a sentence, right? And you can think about Greek and Cypriot, which have this sort of inversion. Okay, so a rule of thumb, if you're gonna use it in your work, uh, if you're gonna use a visual transformer, people say that you know it's best to download a model that has been trained on around 10 to 14 million of data. And if you cannot do that, just use CNNs, okay? Uh, so finishing, uh, I'm gonna give you uh, some small examples on how matrix and tensor factorizations are used in deep learning. So to bring together these two elements that I discussed. Uh, firstly, most of the parameter efficient fine tuning methods that are out there rely on matrix factorizations or tensor factorizations. For example, uh, low rank adaptation of large language models, LoRa, another recent paper that was out called SVDIF, SVDIF essentially do low rank decompositions on the weights of the data. And basically by doing, let's say that instead of representing this D times D matrix W, I have an A and B matrix, right? That have less dimensionality than D on their, uh, on their columns basically and their rows uh, analogously. So in essence, I can have something that's much less uh, in terms of storage space and in terms of inference space because you have to infer the parameters that are on these vectors. And then I just do outer products of the columns and I get you know, the original updated matrix back. The idea basically is instead of updating a large model that has three trillion parameters, right? I learn some very low rank, uh, low dimensional vectors that when I, let's say uh, I have a stable diffusion model trained on billions of data and I want my phase to be in there, right? I can learn how much, uh, what what I need to add to the weight of the pre-existing model, right? By learning these low rank AB matrices. And then I can save that file into like one megabyte file instead of 15 gigabytes. And I can send it to you guys and you can use my face wherever you want. No, we're not gonna do that. But uh, this is basically what LoRa does. It's a very popular method, right? And now SVDIF is another recent method that is out in this in this kind of direction that works for stable diffusion. And essentially what it does is, well, you have a convolutional kernel, right? You take that convolutional kernel and you apply singular value decomposition, which is basically like PCA. So at the end of the day, you get eigenvectors and eigenvalues or singular values from the convolutional kernel. So what this method does is it takes these singular values of the kernel, let's say you train that model on stable diffusion, and finds a delta, some addition to this spectral uh, component that will change the convolutional kernel to generate your face. And then you give that delta to people and they can generate images of whatever object you want, right? So this is these are ways that, you know, because no uh, nobody has two or three million to give to, to open AI to fine tune their model, at least from this room, I guess. Uh, and because it's quite costly to fine tune these models, uh, using this sort of decomposition and smart tricks on the kernels and on the weights allows us to fine tune very quickly, very sparsely, and very you know uh, nicely. Let's say uh, we can also use PCA to interpret uh, this kind of large scale networks or other other approaches. Let's say so. These are uh, basically we take a gun that's trained on some data. We don't have any labels. We don't know anything about it, and we do PCA on the weights or on the activation space. And then we get the first again vector. We add things to our latent space. We can change the hairstyle of a person, but that's without seeing any labels about hair or whatever, right? We can also do this for numbers on NIST. In the lab, we did this for satellite images. So we have a gun trained on satellite images. You can start from a lake and you can go to a football field. You can start from a field and you can go to a, you know an urban area. You can start from a desert and go to an urban area. So you know you can basically have control 
over uh, the edit process of the image without ever having any labels, right? So nobody gives you any labels ever. Uh, because we don't have time, I'm just going to be really fast. But there are ways of doing this in a more even more principled way. So, for example, we know that convolutional layers, you know, in their channel dimension, they have appearance information, while in their spatial dimensions, they have more geometric information. So, if we design, let's say, an optimization problem that can capture this uh, very quickly, this is because these p factors that you see here. Uh, are orthogonal and non-negative. So basically they can give us parts. So they activate when a, when a pixels activate together in your input. So that's a mode of variation, let's say. Uh, and what we can do is we can decompose it in this way and edit, you know, again, in every way that we would like without ever seeing any supervision information, even do classification. Uh, and I have another application on clip that I will talk fast. So clip is like a model that, you know, you give an image and you give a caption. And if the caption corresponds to the image, then the representation should be the same, right? So we get uh, we get the, the features from clip and we design a very simple optimization problem that changes the variability of the clip representations depending on what part of speech they are addressing. So uh, just to give you an example, if you use clip straight out from the box and you give this image, it's going to highlight goldfish as the most important keyword, right, of the image. Gold and is second and swimming is third. But who says that it should be the order? Why is, let's say, the goldfish here more important than the, than the swimming part, right? So it all depends on what you want to do. If you want to study an action, let's say, then you care more about the representation that has to do with verbs, right? But if you want to, let's say, detect an object, you would care more about the representations that have to do with nouns, right? So in any case, this very simple optimization problem uh, solves this thing in closed form. Uh, and essentially, we can do nice things like block styles of artists or you know, uh, block uh, generative models from generating toxic content you know, and things like that. OK, so this was it from me, guys. Uh, thanks for listening. And sorry if the talk was a little bit you know, technically challenged. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what we we continue now because we're a bit late. Yeah. Yeah. You basically have this attention mechanism, which basically compares everything with everything in terms of your tokens. So with the attention mechanism, you can straightforwardly visualize where the transformer has paid attention, right? So you can visualize the image and you can see the region that has been used in order to get to an output. And there is a very different way that features are distributed in transformers. Uh, in comparison to CNN. So they seem to have more global information throughout the network. While with CNNs, this is mostly, let's say, hierarchical. So you start with edges, then you go to shapes. From shapes, you go to faces, and so on. Uh, and with CNNs, in order to get to that kind of interpretation, like attention nets, you need to have, um, you need to do something something like gradient propagation or GradCam or this kind of approaches that will, let's say, given an input, but will only us will highlight these regions in your image. While with transformers, you get that straight out of the box, but they need a lot, a lot of data. Okay. Uh, not necessarily, because it's it, it has a lot to do with the amount of data that you have and the problem that you work with, right? So if you have a lot of data, you know, transformers are, are a good choice uh, because they basically, let me put it like this, uh, transformers can capture a wider family of functions than convolutions. But this is why they need more data. So you could use convolutions as an input to the transformer, then you have, let's say, to one extent, the best of both worlds. Yeah.
Well, basically, you know, this is what's happening, basically. But the, the motivation, the primary motivation that the guys from this paper have is that we don't want to change the original model. Yeah, so if you look at uh, tensorization in deep networks and things like that, you will find that there are a lot of methods that actually take, let's say, a unit and they tensorize it. So they do what you say, in a way, uh, by changing the architecture of the network. So what you say is that they do they do this kind of low-ranked compositions or other compositions, and they find parameterizations that are more efficient, that give the same. So this exists. It's just that now with these very very large models, people are motivated to avoid changing the parameter space, so that you know you don't have to download 100 gigabytes for one of new object, right? Thank you very much, Michali. So our next, next speaker is Professor Konstantin Pobrolis. He's our director of Castor C. Joined us in January this year from Georgia Tech. Uh, network science, machine learning, AI, all this nice stuff. Thank you, Padeli. So I don't think we have an official break right now, but if you need a short break, um, it's fine. It will probably take me just one second here to get ready. Thank <laughs> you. 